In this video, we are going to examine how glycolysis and gluconeogenesis are regulated. In general, metabolic processes can be regulated in several ways. They can be regulated by the availability of the substrate, concentration of the enzymes, allosteric regulation of enzymes, or covalent modification, for example, phosphorylation of enzymes. It is important to know that only irreversible steps can be regulated. Reversible steps can occur in either direction, and those are not regulated steps. Only irreversible steps are regulated. Now, when we consider regulation of glycolysis itself, uh, we have identified three irreversible steps in the glycolysis pathway. And those three irreversible steps are steps that have large negative delta G that are exergonic. So they are the ones that can be regulated and are regulated. They are catalyzed by enzymes hexokinase, phosphofructokinase, and pyruvate kinase. How is glycolysis regulated? Depends on whether glycolysis occurs in the skeletal muscle or in the liver. In the skeletal muscle, glycolysis provides ATP or energy for muscle contractions. In the liver, purpose of glycolysis is to provide glucose to maintain normal blood levels of glucose. Since those two roles are rather different, regulation is somewhat different. So first we'll look at regulation of glycolysis in the skeletal muscle. And the first regulation point is regulation of hexokinase. Hexokinase catalyzes phosphorylation of glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. And regulation is relatively simple. It's by feedback inhibition. So the reaction product, glucose 6-phosphate, inhibits hexokinase. High concentration of the reaction product, glucose 6-phosphate, is a signal that cell no longer requires glucose for energy and also no longer requires glucose for synthesis of glycogen. And so simply uh, uh, phosphorylation of glucose stops. But it's important to understand that this is not committed step of glycolysis because hexokinase converts glucose to glucose 6-phosphate that can enter different metabolic pathways. So it only commits glucose to metabolism but not to glycolysis. So this is not a very important regulation point. The most important regulation point of glycolysis would be next step, which is committed step of glycolysis, and that one is formation of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, and that's catalyzed by phosphofructokinase. So that's the one that we are going to look at next. So regulation of phosphofructokinase is the most important regulation point of glycolysis because that's the committed step of glycolysis metabolic pathway. So, as I already mentioned, it's the most important control site of glycolysis, and the primary means of control is the energy charge of the cell. And energy charge of the cell is indicated by ATP-AMP ratio. It's very important to understand it's ATP-AMP, adenosine monophosphate ratio, so not adenosine diphosphate, and that will become clear in a minute. Also, low pH inhibits the enzyme. Uh, that inhibition, that's effectively inhibition of anaerobic glycolysis, because under anaerobic conditions in uh, humans and mammals, when glycolysis occurs, lactic acid is produced. Pyruvate is converted to lactic acid and that results in low pH of the cell. If a pH of the cell were to drop to really low values, that would uh, damage the cell. So, simply glycolysis stops to prevent damage of the cell or eventually muscle from accumulation of too much lactic acid. Now, ATP-AMP ratio or energy charge of the cell is very important way to regulate phosphofructokinase or and in turn glycolysis. In a cell, when ATP is depleted, so an, when energy runs low, additional ATP can be synthesized by what we call disproportionation of ADP. So two molecules of ADP are disproportionated. So one is converted, so one molecule of 
inorganic or sorry yeah one molecule of inorganic phosphate is transferred from one molecule of ADP to another and that results in generation of one molecule of ATP and one molecule of AMP this ATP now in turn can be used to satisfy energy needs of the cell but now a molecule of adenosine monophosphate or AMP has appeared and when it appears then this is a signal that cell is in a low energy state that it needs energy and so um, these two molecules ATP and AMP affect phosphofructokinase and so uh, high ATP levels allosterically inhibit phosphofructokinase because uh, energy state of the cell is high and glycolysis should stop no more energy is needed on the other hand AMP reverses the inhibition it competes with ATP for the same allosteric site of the enzyme but while ATP when bound to allosteric site of the enzyme changes the shape of the enzyme of phosphofructokinase and prevents further phosphorylation of fructose 6-phosphate AMP reverses that inhibition it binds to the same allosteric site without changing shape of the enzyme and allows enzyme to continue phosphorylation of fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate of course there is communication between phosphofructokinase and hexokinase and the reason for communication is that substrate is effectively the same product of hexokinase catalyzed reaction is glucose 6-phosphate which upon isomerization to fructose 6-phosphate is now substrate starting material for reaction catalyzed by phosphofructokinase which means that when phosphofructokinase is inactive and that means that uh, levels of ATP are high or pH is low glucose 6-phosphate accumulates because phosphofructokinase is not converting fructose 6-phosphate into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate if fructose 6-phosphate is accumulating it's of course equilibrating with glucose 6-phosphate because that equilibration isomerization reaction is reversible and as glucose 6-phosphate accumulates its inhibitor of hexokinase it means that inhibition of phosphofructokinase also leads to inhibition of hexokinase and so that's how these two enzymes communicate and we have pyruvate kinase as final regulation point of glycolysis ATP which is indicate indicator of high energy charge of the cell allosterically inhibits pyruvate kinase also amino acid alanine which is synthesized from pyruvate uh, and is an indicator that pyruvate is abundant also allosterically inhibits pyruvate kinase so those two compounds allosterically inhibit pyruvate kinase on the other hand fructose 1,6 bisphosphate activates pyruvate kinase that's an example of feed forward stimulation the reason why fructose 1,6 bisphosphate activates pyruvate kinase is so that all of the intermediates down the pathway of glycolysis can be processed so that they don't accumulate so all of the in intermediates in the sequence that goes from fructose 1,6 bisphosphate to pyruvate can be processed so that they don't accumulate in the course of glycolysis So here is a summary of regulation of glycolysis in a skeletal muscle. Regulated steps are shown in this scheme. And as you can see, the principal point of regulation is the committed step of glycolysis, which is catalyzed by phosphofructokinase. In the liver, glycolysis is regulated very differently from muscle or actually muscle and the brain. In muscles and brain, regulation is the same in liver it is different so one of the roles of the liver is to maintain blood glucose levels uh, it stores glucose as glycogen when glucose is abundant and releases it when the level is low the liver also uses glucose to generate reducing agent NADPH for biosynthesis of other molecules
we'll cover NADPH later in this course. Hexokinase is one regulatory point of regulation of glycolysis in the liver, but actually it is not important. So in the liver, hexokinase is controlled the same way as in the muscle, but as I already mentioned, it is not important enzyme, because in the liver, that's not important glycolysis enzyme. A primary enzyme that was phosphorylates glucose in the liver is glucokinase, sometimes it's also called hexokinase B. That one actually has a low affinity for glucose, about 50 times lower than, than that of hexokinase. And of course, that's uh, on purpose, because that way glucokinase is active only when glucose levels are high. And uh, glucokinase will bind to glucose and commit it, or actually will commit it to metabolism in the liver, only when hexokinase is already saturated and cannot bind any more glucose. So glucokinase only binds to an excess of glucose. So that way, brain and muscles receive all the glucose they need, and then any excess is taken up by the liver. Uh, glucokinase provides glucose 6-phosphate for synthesis of glycogen and fatty acids. Uh, glucose 6-phosphate is not an inhibitor of glucokinase. As was the case with the muscle, phosphofructokinase is also the main regulatory point of glycolysis in the liver. But there are obviously differences. First, low pH is not a metabolic signal because lactate is not produced in the liver. Uh, phosphofructokinase is regulated by ATP-AMP ratio, but it's not as important as muscles as ATP levels in the liver don't fluctuate that much. Citrate, which is an early intermediate of citric acid cycle, and we'll be covering that very soon, inhibits phosphofructokinase. And that's because high citrate levels mean that biosynthetic precursors are abundant. So citrate inhibits phosphofructokinase by enhancing inhibi inhibitory effect, that's allosteric effect of ATP. Uh, glycolysis is accelerated when glucose is abundant. So increased levels of glucose in blood result in formation of glucose 6-phosphate, and that in turn promotes synthesis of a signal molecule, which is fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. And then fructose 2,6-bisphosphate signals to, indicate, to accelerate glycolysis. Now don't confuse, don't mix up fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, which is a signal molecule, and is produced in very small amounts, with fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, which is a metabolite, which is key metabolite in uh, glycolysis. Fructose 2,6-bisphosphate increases phosphofructokinase's activity by enhancing its, ability, its affinity for fructose 6-phosphate and diminishing the inhibitory effect of ATP. And that's also another example of feed-forward stimulation. Uh, so when, in this case, when uh, glucose 6-phosphate is abundant, then feed-forward stimulation occurs to stimulate uh, glycolysis in the liver. Pyruvate kinase is also a regulatory point of glycolysis in the liver. It was in uh, regulatory point of glycolysis in the muscle, and it is also in the liver. There are several different isozymic forms of pyruvate kinase, and they are encoded by different genes. L-type is predominant in the liver, and M-type is predominant in the muscle and the brain. Both forms respond in the same way to allosteric regulation. However, the L-form can be also controlled by covalent modification, and that's reversible phosphorylation. When blood glucose level is low, the glucagon-triggered cyclic adenosine monophosphate, or CAMP, cascade leads to phosphorylation of pyruvate kinase, and it diminishes its activity. This prevents liver from consuming or uptaking glucose at times when it is needed 
by the brain and the muscles. In the course of metabolism, glucose is transported in and out of cells, and various transporters are involved. Here is a very brief overview of the most important trans transporters. Uh, those transporters are labeled as GLUT transporters, and 1 through 5 are the most important. GLUT 1 and 3 transporters are present in nearly all of the mammalian cells and are responsible for transport of glucose under normal conditions. Their Km is 1 millimol, and that means at that concentration, uh, one half of the maximum transport rate is reached. Since normal serum uh, glucose level is 4 to 8 millimoles, that means that they are usually fully saturated and continuously transport glucose at constant rate. Uh, GLUT2 transporter is present in the liver and pancreatic beta cells, and it, is, it has very high Km, about 15 to 20 millimoles, which means that under ordinary conditions it doesn't really transport much glucose. But uh, when, the, when concentration of glucose is high, then GLUT2 transporter is very active, and then um, glucose enters livers, and in particular pancreas. And that's how pancreas senses that glucose level is high and releases insulin. Also, at that same time, of course, liter will be rapidly uptaking glucose. A GLUT4 transporter has Km of about 5 millimoles, and it transports glucose into muscle and fat cells. A presence of insulin increases the number of GLUT4 transporters through transcriptional control. Finally, GLUT5 transporter is present in the small intestines, and it is actually a fructose transporter. We have already seen how glycolysis is regulated. Now we are going to see how both glycolysis and gluconeogenesis are regulated. Uh, two pathways are reciprocally regulated, so that within a cell one pathway is relatively inactive, while the other one is highly active. Uh, both pathways are exergonic, that means both consume energy, and if they were both active at the same time, the net result would be hydrolysis of four molecules of NTP a nucleotide triphosphate, two molecules of ATP, and two GTP. So, overall result would be actually consumption for use of energy, and nothing would be produced in return. So, uh, the amounts of, and activities of enzymes are controlled so that only one pathway is active at a time. Rate of glycolysis is determined by the concentration of glucose, and the rate of gluconeogenesis is determined by the concentration of lactate and other precursors of glucose. When energy is needed, glycolysis predominates, while when there is an excess of energy, gluconeogenesis predominates. The first regulation point is the interconversion of fructose 6-phosphate and fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, so two irreversible processes that are part of parts of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. So phosphofructokinase, glycolysis enzyme, is activated by AMP and fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. It is inhibited by ATP, citrate, and low pH. Fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase, so gluconeogenesis enzyme, is activated by citrate and inhibited by AMP and fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Uh, citrate uh, is a compound that uh, is crucial to citric acid cycle, and we'll cover that a little bit later. High levels of citrate indicate an energy-rich situation and the presence of precursors of, for biosynthesis. Regulation is summarized in this scheme. So you can see conversion of fructose 6-phosphate and interconversion between fructose 6-phosphate and fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So uh, glycolysis is shown on the left with phosphofructokinase as enzyme and gluconeogenesis on the right with fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. So, uh, and uh, how they are regulated is shown with 
um, activators in green and inhibitors in red. Next regulation point is the interconversion of phosphoenol pyruvate and pyruvate. Pyruvate kinase, glycolysis enzyme, is activated by fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, so feedforward stimulation we covered earlier, and inhibited by ATP and alanine. So uh, low energy state and abundance of biochemical precursors. Both gluconeogenesis enzymes are inhibited by ADP and pyruvate carboxylase is activated by acetyl coenzyme A. This is summarized in this diagram. So on the left again is glycolysis and on the right are two gluconeogenesis steps that bypass this glycolysis step. Acetyl coenzyme A is actually feedforward stimulation. It's an example of feedforward stimulus simulation. And here is a summary of regulation of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis, which steps are regulated in each biochemical pathway. If you wish, you can stop the video here and examine this in more detail. In the liver, rates of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis are adjusted to maintain blood glucose levels. And so regulation is accomplished by means of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. We have already seen that this is a signal molecule and uh, that molecule activates phosphofructokinase enzyme, PFK, and inhibits fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. Since fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is an important signal molecule, its synthesis is regulated and it's regulated by a single bifunctional enzyme. That enzyme contains two domains, PFK2, phosphofructokinase 2 domain, which uh, phosphorylates fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. And uh, fructose bisphosphatase 2, FBPase 2, which dephosphorylates fructose 2,6-bisphosphate back to fructose 6-phosphate. So, enzyme contains a regulatory domain, a kinase domain, so one that carries out phosphorylation of fructose 6-phosphate, and phosphatase domain, one that carries dephosphorylation of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. The activity of the enzyme PKA2, FBPase2, is controlled by phosphorylation of one serine residue on the enzyme, on the regulatory domain of the enzyme. So when blood glucose level is low, a rise in level of glucagon triggers a CAMP cascade and that leads to phosphorylation of PKA2 FPPase2 enzyme. Phosphorylation inhibits PKA2 and activates FPPase2. And conversely, when blood glucose level is high, gluconeogenesis is not needed and the PKA2 FEPS2 enzyme is dephosphorylated. That activates PKA2 and inhibits FEPAS2. Insulin and glucagon are two hormones that regulate blood glucose levels. Both insulin and glucagon alter the gene, gene expression by changing the rate of transcription or the rate of synthesis of proteins. Insulin stimulates expression of phosphofructokinase, pyruvate kinase, and the bifunctional enzyme PKA2 FPPase2. So that means that insulin uh, stimulates expression of enzymes that are involved in glycolysis. Glucagon inhibits expression of those enzymes and stimulates expression of phosphoenol pyruvate carboxylase and fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. So glucagon inhibits expression of the glycolysis enzymes and stimulates expression of gluconeogenesis enzymes. A transcriptional control of enzymes takes hours to days, while allosteric control that we have covered earlier 
takes seconds to minutes. A pair of reaction, reactions such as phosphorylation of fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and reverse dephosphorylation of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate back to fructose 6-phosphate is called a substrate cycle. If such substrate cycle were to occur, then net result is hydrolysis of ATP and generation of heat. Nothing else happens, nothing is produced or degraded. All that happens is that ATP is hydrolyzed and heat is generated. There is often limited amount of cycling in pairs of opposed irreversible reactions, and that is done to produce heat. But also it could happen to be an imperfection of metabolic control. And, in, and then those cycles are called futile cycles. Substrate cycles may also amplify metabolic signals. So if we consider hypothetical substrate cycle, where A is converted to B at the rate of 100 and B is converted to A at the rate of 90, then net flux is 10. If enzymes that are involved in conversion of A to B and B to A are allosterically regulated in such a way that each is affected by 20%, so rate of conversion of A to B is increased by 20%, so now it's 120, and rate of conversion of B to A is decreased by 20%, so now rate is 72, then net flux is 48. That means that only 20% change in rates of the opposing reactions resulted in 380% increase in the net flux. So the metabolic signal has been amplified. And this completes our examination of control of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis.